Well, good morning, everybody. Very warm welcome to our service this morning. Please, would you stand as we sing our opening hymn, Immortal Invisible. Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Please do take a seat. A very warm welcome to everybody gathered here today. My name's Michael. I'm the vicar here at St. Thomas's and it's good to be with you today. A few things to say as we begin our service. Firstly, a big thank you to those who came to our cleanup yesterday um, between 10 and 12. Had a great time cleaning up the gutters and the trees and the leaves and all sorts out there. So thank you to all those involved with that. There is a toy fair on the 15th of October and volunteers are needed uh, to help with providing tea, coffee and cake during the toy sale. Proceeds go to church funds and if anybody is available to help for an hour that day or provide a cake, please do speak to Judy Osborne or me as you leave. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, the bishops have been writing to us and uh, have been speaking to us about the communion wine. So you'll know that we haven't been receiving communion wine for quite a while now due to COVID. We've just been receiving the bread. Um, the bishops felt that it's time to get back to offering the common cup. And so that's what we will do. Um, so today, when we come up for Holy Communion, there will be both bread and wine available. There is no pressure at all to take the wine from the common cup. Some people will feel comfortable with that. Some people won't feel comfortable with that. So as you come forward, please do just pop your hands out to receive bread. And then if you'd like to, please do just stay and the common cup will be offered to you as well. Please can we also just add on that, um, we're not allowed to do what's called intincting, which is when you put the bread into the wine. That's not allowed anymore um, due to hygiene reasons. That's thought to be less hygienic than any other method of distributing communion. So when you receive communion, please receive the bread, and then if you'd like to, please receive the wine, but both of those separately. Thank you very much. 
If you have a children's society box, um, we'd love to have those back. Nick and Diane Brown would love to uh, have those. So please do bring back your children's society boxes if you haven't already. And then our final notice comes from Bishop Philip, who uh, is on a little video just now. So I'm standing here in Blackburn Cathedral next to an extraordinary art installation made to celebrate 70 years of Her Majesty. Little did we know just a few weeks ago when we were opening that the Queen was so close to her death. And we're thinking and reflecting back now after the most extraordinary period of mourning. Many experiences that I expect quite a lot of us will need a long time to process them. We've seen beautiful scenes of mourning of people queuing on the streets. We've seen incredibly beautiful acts of worship and music, times when people have really come together and supported each other. We've seen a smooth transfer of power, and what a gift that is, something never to be taken for granted. And I'm now thinking, what will the legacy of this extraordinary life be? What will be the legacy of the Queen's service? Because my prayer is that many will be inspired by her to make their lives a gift and to give themselves away in service of their communities, especially the poorest. And also, what will be the legacy of her faith? Her Majesty, who was inspired so deeply by this strong, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd love to think that people across Lancashire, across the country, will reflect on what inspired this life of dedication and will explore who Jesus is, what he came to do, and what it means to be in relationship with him today. I'd love to see those two legacies, the legacy of service, the legacy of faith, as we come to the end of ten remarkable days. begin our service, our children and young people are going to leave us now for our Sunday club in just a moment. Shall we pray for them as we begin our service? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of our church and for all the children and young people gathered here today. Would you be with them as they go across to Sunday club and be their teacher? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brilliant. So if our children and young people would like to follow Carrie and Julie out now, that would be fab. Um, if we don't have a consent form from you as a parent, um, we'd love to encourage you just to go over as well and to fill in a little consent form for your children. That would be smashing. Thank you very much. So for those of us who remain, there's going to be a prayer coming up on the screen just in just a moment. There we go. Let's pray together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you, and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry, and repent of all our sins, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shall we stand and sing our praise to God?
Lord God, defend your church from all false teaching and give to your people knowledge of your truth that we may enjoy eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please do be seated as our scripture readings are brought to us today. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses 1 to 3, 8, and 6 to 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is coming to you and to say, buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the night right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, buy my field that is at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anatoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Barak, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this seed deal of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses, and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. 
But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes or the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please do stand if you're able to sing our second hymn.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So let's just bow our heads and pray. Father God, as we come to your word, we pray that you will speak to each one of us within our hearts. For we ask it through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We had the reading from 1 Timothy brought to us, and I want us to have a look at that. Uh, but before, there are some other verses which tend to explain better what is happening during that letter that was read to us. So it's from chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversy and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. That, those are the verses prior to the ones that were read to us. Now, Timothy, he was a young man who had been trained by Paul to be a missionary. The idea would be that Paul would go out and establish a group of new converts, and Timothy ran the group until it could look after itself. Now, Timothy, uh, when he received this letter, was in Ephesus. Now, the big problem that Timothy had was this, this church was very mixed. 
there were very rich people, there were very poor people, there were Gentiles, there were Jews, there were slaves, and along with the slaves was their masters. The Gentiles were new converts from pagan worship. So there were lots of baggage brought with the different people and different mindsets. And Timothy was trying and struggling to sort these things out. Now the thing is about this letter, obviously it's come from Paul. What we don't know is, is it in reply to a, a, a letter from Timothy, who was writing for advice as he faced these problems? Or was it something people had reported to Paul? We don't know. What we do know is that Timothy was in the most difficult place you could expect him to be. Because he, by nature, he was a gentle person. And Paul is writing to support him and encourage him in the situation he's in. Now, support and encouragement are essential things in ministry and in the church, one to another. For instance, George, who was my vicar in the church I came from in the village of Newborough many years ago, he was a, a great one for encouraging people. I tell you, he must have won gold stars in heaven because at his funeral there were numerous readers and vicars, an archdeacon and others as well who'd all been encouraged into ministry by George. He was clearly, uh, clearly a remarkable man. When I was the curate, my vicar then was called Derek. Derek was of a similar nature. He was absolutely brilliant with me in encouraging. And encouragement is a wonderful thing. One to another. It's easy to forget that the person you might be talking to, or they might be doing something different, either in the church or elsewhere, and they need encouraging to go forward. When I was leaving um, <laughs> Derek, um, and we were in street in Somerset, the, the last hymn he wanted for us to hear was Hills of the North Rejoice, because we were coming to Blackpool. Now, I said that our friend Timothy was a young man. And he was facing many problems. When I was reading this, it rather took me back, and for, I guess, uh, nearly 50 years. And uh, it was when I was a young man and I'd been promoted by the company. I was an assistant manager uh, working from an office in Wrexham. But I had a problem. Everybody around me was older than I was. My clients were older. The people I was supposed to be in charge of were older. And me, even though by then I'd, uh, um, I'd been married for five or six years, we were married quite young, I've still got the same model, it's at the back. But, 
she hasn't got time to train another one. Um, but because I, 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 I actually looked like I just left school. So that, that's not the, be the best thing to be. So uh, we thought, right, somehow I've got to look a little bit more mature. So we, I decided I would grow a mustache, a mustache. There was only one problem. I didn't have stubble, I had baby down. So after trying for, for, for a, a few weeks and then it got to a couple of months, there was nothing to see on this top lip except baby down. So then Janice, as usual, came up with a solution. She got up, <laughs> got out her eyebrow pencil and went, Yup! And suddenly I had a mustache. And, uh, well, I kidded myself. I, I looked like something from Hollywood then, you see, with a little trim mustache on. Um, I don't know whether it was psychological, but I felt better about it and somehow was able to cope. But here was this young man struggling with all these problems. Wondering how he was going to make his way through. How he was going to teach them. How he was going to come to a solution. To bring this group of disparate people together. So they became the body of Christ. Paul said in verse 6 of that chapter. Great gain in godliness combined with contentment is the way forward. Or to put it another way, holiness. Holiness brings satisfaction. Then he added, if we had food and clothing, we will be content with these. So you see, Paul is cutting straight to what is essential. A connection with God and a love of God, and at the same time, what is essential to our being? In the middle of the words, though, are these. For we brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it. We have a common saying, which, much to my surprise, I found out was Spanish. There are no pro, uh, pockets in a shroud. Then Paul goes back to attack those who are abusing their position within the group of Christians. In this case, he was pointing out about those who were wealthy. If you remember, I read out that those who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Now, coming from a sales background, I can understand where some of these people might be coming from. There's a new pool of possible clients to go to, to sell your wares to. Well, that's not where they should have been. Paul writes, those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That word plunge has the meaning of as to be drowned in the sea. In verse 10, Paul goes on, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. You often find that um, part of that is misquoted. And people say, money is the root of all evil. But Paul says, it is the love of money. 
It is that, that love that can become a drug. I was listening to a man who worked in the financial sector of London. And he was a Christian. And he was talking about the treadmill that is there for some people. The more success you had, the higher you got. The more you earned, the more you wanted. It simply got out of control. The goal of achievement became greater than all other needs, including for family. The symbols that they had around them were a reflection of the pursuit of what they saw to be perfection, to what had now become their God. The largest house, the newest car, the sharpest suit, more influence, more power, more divorce, more unhappiness. This was self-destruction. It was literally drowning in a sea of desire over need. When I was involved in the insurance industry, what seems a lifetime ago, I saw the same thing in the 80s. And it was that that brought about the crash of the banks also. Now, none of this means that wealth is wrong. Many wealthy men have used their money for good. They have invested in their communities or even created them. For instance, Bourneville, Lever Soaps, both created model villages for workers and for others. The Quakers showed the way in this. Schools, colleges were founded, libraries. John Wesley, that great preacher, was reputed to make do with 24 pounds per annum. If you don't know who John Wesley is, he was a preacher way in the um, 1800s. So, money went a bit further. But, he gave everything else away to his maximum earnings, which was 30 pounds. But towards the end of his life, he was earning 1,500 pounds. But his cost of living had risen to 30 pounds, and the rest he gave away. Many wealthy individuals support charities and communities. Paul's concern was a reflection of our gospel reading of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember the rich man? He spurned God in that reading. He didn't need him. He was self-sufficient. He had great wealth. So wealthy that he just ignored the man who was on the gate. Lazarus, on the other hand, who was completely helpless, he hung on to God You see, it wasn't the rich man's wealth Jesus was showing up in that parable, but his attitude to God, which led him, led his greed and self-centeredness to destroy him. That was the real message from that gospel. 
Where is God? That's the same message that Paul is asking. Where is God in these people's lives? See, Paul's instruction to Timothy came out very simple towards the end. Number one, tell them to get their act together. Number two, stop their pomposity. Number three, stop focusing on certainty of riches. Number four, focus on God. Then they were to do good, be rich in good works, be generous, and be ready to share. So how does all this apply to us? It leads us to question where we stand in our relationship with God. Are we merely lip servants only? Where is our heart in this matter? Are we so confident in ourselves that we do not need a personal audit of where we stand in service and in worship of God? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this letter to Timothy and the questions that it brings up. Help us in our own, our own hearts and minds to look at ourselves and not to be afraid, but to examine our own motives and our own love of you. For we ask it through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Evan. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, priests never get to retire. They just stop getting paid. And today is Evan's 34th anniversary of being ordained. And so in recognition of that, Evan, I've just got you a very small but extremely tasty present. <laughs> and thank you on behalf of us all for all that you do for us here at St. Thomas's in retirement and have done for a long time and at your previous parishes as well. Thank you very much. Right. Shall we stand and confess our faith in the words of the Creed? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Amen. Please do sit or kneel as Jonathan brings to us our prayers today. Lord, we come to you in humility. Fill our hearts with your love. Lord, we ask you to guide all your servants who work to share your good news, bishops, priests, and deacons. And as the Diocese of Blackburn searches for the next diocesan bishop to follow Bishop Julian, we ask that you will grant those who will make decisions the gift of discernment so that your will may be done. In our own parish, we thank you for the work of Michael, Catherine, and Evan, and we pray that you will encourage them in leading us in faith and worship. We bring before you all those involved in leading our worship each week at the 10.30 communion service, with our Thursday communion service, and at our newly established 4.30 service. Lord, grant your servants knowledge and a true understanding of your word. Help them to know your will. Encourage them and give them the strength and confidence to live out your love in their actions, that your kingdom come. Lord, in your mercy. Today, as we hear the story of the rich man and Lazarus and read Paul's letter to Timothy, we are reminded of how easy it is to be self-absorbed in our own world and ignore the troubles of those around us. Loving God, we are often so busy in living our own lives, achieving the next goal, sharing our lives with friends, celebrating success, we grow blind to those in need. Gradually, they become invisible. Lord, make the scales fall from our eyes so that we see you in the poor, in the needy, and reach out to them in love with all that we have. Lord, in your mercy. As we hear the story of Jeremiah and his purchase of land occupied by the Babylonians, land that seems worthless, we also hear God's message of hope and the promise that the land will be restored. Father, we are so often weak when our faith is tested. We ask you to strengthen our trust in you in the certain knowledge that your son Jesus died to save us from our sin. Lord, our faith is often tested and we are often in a turmoil of believing and doubting. We step out in faith but then lose our nerve. Help us to see that faith is not about having the strength to hold on to you but having the humility to be held. Lord, in your mercy. We live in a world torn apart by conflict. Send down your wisdom, Lord, upon all those in power so that they might seek peace, not conflict. We think today of the people of Ukraine who are on the, in the midst of a terrible war. Lord, reach out into the hearts of the powerful. Tell them that peace is not a rampart of gleaming missiles or grateful poor receiving food from trucks, but the shouting of children at play, the babble of tongues set free, the thunder of dancing feet and a parent's voice singing. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we hold in our hearts all those who are troubled, those who are sick, and those who are grieving. 
We ask you to offer them your love, your comfort, your hope. We pray for all those who need your healing touch. And we bring before you all those known personally to us. Jesus, Saviour, look upon all those who watch or weep this day. Tend to those who are sick. Rest to those who are weary. Soothe those who suffer. Pity those who are afflicted. All for your love's sake. Lord, in your mercy. A week ago, we witnessed the funeral of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and rejoiced in her life of service. Let us call to mind all those who have died and those who mourn their loss. In the sure and certain knowledge of eternal life won for us on the cross, we give you thanks for all those we love but see no longer, who through their presence or through their deeds of love has brought us joy and laughter and enriched the world by their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we come to you in humility. Make us whole. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. God has called us to live in peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you. Please do stand and offer one, one another a sign of peace. As we stand, we sing our next hymn, Before the Throne of God Above.
is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened, he opened his, his arms, arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As, As we, we eat and drink, drink these holy gifts, make, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. take your seats again and as our saviour taught us so we pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for, for the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
In just a moment, you'll be invited forward to receive bread and possibly wine. Please don't feel under any pressure to receive the wine. Nobody will be looking or judging or passing comments on whether or not anybody chooses to or chooses not to. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We, we do not presume to come, come to this your table, table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but, but in your manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs on your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may ever more dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. the blood of Christ.
Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your church with your perpetual mercy. And because without you our human frailty cannot but fall, keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say a prayer of thanks to God for all that God has done for us. Almighty God, we we thank thank you for feeding us with with the the body and and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just two very quick notices as we come to the end of our service today. If anybody would like to sign up for a new home group, we're hoping to start one on a Thursday and maybe if lots of people want to on a Monday as well. So that would be two new ones. We've already got one on a Tuesday. There's a sheet out on the right hand side as you leave. Please scribble your name on that as you go. And also we're hoping to have a confirmation service here in April of 2023. If you or anybody else you know in year six or year seven or eight or nine who has not yet been confirmed would like to be confirmed, or if you're an adult and would like to be confirmed, please do speak to me as you leave and I can take your details as we think about that. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In In the the name name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's Let's stand stand and sing our magnificent time hymn over a thousand tongues to sing. sing.